What does Jesus mean when he gives us parables of workers? That's what we're going to talk about today in Matthew 20. Last time we were reading about Jesus, he was off beyond the Jordan talking to people in the crowd follow him. So he starts us off in 20. Obviously, again, the chapters are not biblical. Those were individual sections that people invented so we could refer to them. But 20 starts off with talking about what the kingdom of heaven is. And so the head of the household, the person who owns the house, hires a bunch of laborers to work in his vineyard. And then they all agree to a denarius. And a denarius was essentially equal to one day's labor. I don't know how you build an economy like that, but that's how it was. So a denarius is one day's labor. Fine. He went out in the morning. He hired these. And then the third hour, he goes out again. He sees people standing in the marketplace and tells them, go to the vineyard. Whatever is right, I will give you, meaning the denarius. That's a day's labor. So they went out at about the sixth hour. And again, at the ninth hour, he did the same thing. At the 11th hour, wow, there were 12 hour days. 11th hour, he went out, found even more standing around and said to them, why do you stand here all day? Well, no one hired us. So he says, okay, go to my vineyard. And then at the time when the evening came, the workday was over with, he called all the laborers, whether they worked the 12 hours, I assume, or the one hour and gave them each a denarius. And the people who were first hired said, well, wait a minute. We worked 11 hours more. That's not fair. Why are you giving us the same amount of money of people who worked one hour? And so they grumbled about this. Plus, it's hot. They said it was hot. And after spending two summers in Israel, I can tell you, hot. So they worked, you know, in that vineyard. And he said, look, you all agreed to the denarius. When I hired you, you said the denarius was fine. And when I hired them, they said the denarius is fine. Since you all agreed to this particular price, take what I paid you and go. Am I not able to pay what I want to pay? And are you going to pick on me because I'm generous? Then again, that same sentence again. So the last will be first and the first will be last. What in the world does this mean? So again, we're going to hear more about this. So they start going to Jerusalem. And for those of us who are about to start the Lenten season, we know what that means. This is coming to a head really quickly. So he goes towards Jerusalem and he tells them, just so you understand, the son of man, me, Jesus, he's saying, is going to be delivered into the chief priests. And the scribes, scribes again were the experts, and they will condemn the Son of Man to death, deliver him over to the Gentiles, aka the Romans, and be mocked, flogged, crucified, and then raised on the third day. Again, isn't it surprising how many times now he has said this and the disciples didn't see it coming when it actually happened, but it is coming soon. So this is a warning to them, so they know what's coming. Then we get this a story about the mother of Zebedee. Her name is Salome, and she was also witness to the death of Jesus. So she's a believer. She comes up to Jesus and says, I want my sons to sit on your left hand and on your right hand in the kingdom. And Jesus answered, you don't know what you're asking, because are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? And when you talked about a cup and, or pouring out the cup, it meant something awful about to happen. And if you poured out the cup, the hope is that it doesn't happen to you. But if you drink the cup, that means you are going to take on the very awful thing. And then they said to Jesus and everyone around, yeah, we can do that. I mean, they don't know what they're saying. That's why they were the sons of thunder. Again, impetuous, just like Peter, but they were bold. And Jesus said, you know what? You're right. You are going to drink this cup. But to sit on my left hand or my right hand, that is not for me to grant. But it is for whom God the Father prepared those seats for. And then when the rest of them heard it, I mean, you can tell this is sort of a boastful thing. Like, we're so cool. We want to sit on your left and your right. And Peter's like, what am I, chop liver? So the rest of the apostles were like indignant about it, it says in ESV. And then Jesus called them to him. All right, come here. Let's talk about this. So he tries to explain to them the world around you, particularly the Romans, are about ranking. Even in the temple, the chief priest and the chief elders and the chief scribe and all those things, that this is about gaining foothold against someone else, gaining authority over someone else. And he said, this is not going to be the way with you. Whoever is going to be great must also be your servant. Whoever is going to be first among you must be your slave. And even the son of man 
came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life for ransom for many. He's saying it's not going to be this rat trap world that we have for us. We do this in the world where we're trying to gain advantages and promotions and try to be the grand king of Israel and all those things. And he's like, it's not going to be that way. He could have been angry with them and said things to them about this, but they were excited about the kingdom of heaven. They don't know what they're asking. He already just told them that they are going to sit on 12 thrones and judge the 12 tribes, but they were doing this out of enthusiasm. It was boastful. They were looking for place. And I think the thing that they are about to see, and maybe this is what brought up these conversations, is that they were the first 12. Do they have a special place? Are they special? And they are special because God picked them to be apostles. But does that mean they're going to have a special place in the kingdom too? And so it almost feels to me when reading this that they were trying to make claims. We were the first. We're starting off this church you're saying that you're going to create. We want our place in this, our high place in it. And he's telling them, this is not how this is going to operate. This is not how any of this is going to operate. And he's gently instructing them, I think for humility, you know, because when he's going to talk about the first being last, it might mean that they may not be the first in heaven. (laughs) They may be the last in heaven, but they were the first disciples. That you don't know those things and you can't boast on those things. This is not about position. This is not about levels of order. This is about us being a brotherhood, a sisterhood of mankind worshiping God. And they're just looking at it in the wrong way. And he's going to tell them a little bit more about it. So then they were outside of Jericho, which is, again, where we saw the city walls blown out, you know, as the city was destroyed. For Joshua, back in history, Jericho is a very historic city. It's one of the oldest cities on the planet that we know of. And so Jesus was in Jericho and some blind men came out and said, son of David. Now, son of David is not a declaration of him being God. Because anybody who would be in the line of David would be the son of David. So they're saying he's important, but they're not saying that he's God. And every they're just crying out, come have mercy on us, save us. And he says, what do you want? Then they asked him to open their eyes. And Jesus took pity against that gut-wrenching pity and opened their eyes. And they saw he is willing to do miracles for people. And... We'll talk about it when we get to Mark, but Mark said there was one blind man. Here it says there were two. Well, that's not a contradiction. Don't worry about it too much. People do get hung up on that again when they're trying to find fault with the scripture. If there's one man there, there may be two men there. So it's not that different. So that brings us to the end of uh, 20. And you can see Jesus is, like I said, we started out healing and preaching the good news and talking about how to treat each other. We are talking more and more about the end of what is going to happen in the beginning of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is preparing them for what's going to happen next. So my meditation this week is going to be about envy, I think, this particular case. You know, the story of the workers each getting paid a denarius is about envy. And we have so much envy right now. We are envious all the time. Well, that person this is what they get paid. Or this person, that's what they get for their job. Or this person, they get all these things. They're famous and they get all these riches beyond belief. And what do I get? Nothing. Or I get less. And we are constantly looking at our neighbors to see what they have. This message is for us to focus on God's generosity to us and not drag other people down or be envious of other people because they have more, they did less, they were raised rich, they were raised poor. I mean, we just saw right now him saying in the past chapter that when you're wealthy, you have a hard time going to heaven. I imagine there's all sorts of things that end up temptations to us, like being rich or having the nice house like the guy who didn't want to follow Jesus because he didn't want to live the life on the road or the person who is giving their time. There are many things that are hindrances to us and heaven. And Jesus is trying to tell you, stop being envious, stop looking at your neighbor, look at the generosity you've been given, 
and be thankful and grateful for that. And so my prayer for this week is that I can learn to be happy with what I have. I live a very good life. I grew up very poor. Now I'm not as poor. That is a gift that God has given me. Instead of ever looking at things I wish I had, I need to learn how to have contentment for myself, contentment for the people I see around me, understanding that these are gifts of God and his generosity to me. And what I'd like to share with other people is that message of giving up on envy, giving up on thinking about what other people have and what other gifts God has given them. We feel at times it is unfair because we see people who are not godly given amazing gifts. We see people who are very godly living a life of poverty. We see people who are in the middle, somewhere like the rest of us, and we wish we had what another person wants. I would like to share with other people how envy just is a road to destruction and that we should be grateful about God's generosity to us and also realize that sometimes more is not better, particularly when talking about the kingdom of heaven. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please tell a friend, leave a review if you like. I am trying to grow this podcast. I'm trying to figure out tools and things that will help you study the Bible. Let me know. And you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. Thank you so much for listening. Mm-hmm.